The Justin Robert Young Podcast is brought to you as always by Patreon.com slash J-U-R-Y. Support this show and keep independent media alive. You're out of the holidays now, you know? Maybe give your old buddy Justin a little support. Head on over there. Patreon.com slash J-U-R-Y. Man, if you are not a patron, then you did not get in your RSS feed the Patreon only Friday hype train. We're going to talk about it a little bit today, but whew, whew. Tell you what, those who have been supporting, uh, you got a weird one on your hands. You can be a weird one, too. Patreon.com slash J-U-R-Y. And by my live show, March 1st, 2017, San Francisco, California. It's on a Thursday at 7 p.m. The politics, 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 sex scandals bracket. Folks, if you don't like politics, if you hate politics, Politics. Don't worry. This is not going to be about politics. This is going to be about the embarrassment of politicians. And I think we can all agree that politicians then, now, forever are hilarious when they are embarrassed by their own ample foibles. The sex scandals that have defined our political heritage are on display in bracket form. We will, as a group, decide the best one of all time. Head on over there. Bit.ly slash sf sex show again bit.ly slash sf sex show but enough talking about how we support the show what do you say we just do the damn thing To the Justin Robert Young program. My name is Justin Robert Young. Welcome. Bienvenue. Uh, welcome in. What's up? It's your old boy, Justin Robert Young. Oh, man. Oh, you guys, man. You fucking guys. I don't even know what did. I don't even know what to tell you, man. I don't even know what's going on, man. We're all over the place. Everything's going crazy. It's on fire. We're all doing backflips instead of walking. We're on our hands instead of our feet. This is just the the story of a girl who cried a river and drowned her whole world. Uh, you know, this is uh, uh, this is life. Uh, I'm, I'm a bitch. I'm a mother. I'm a child. I'm a lover. I'm a sinner. I'm a saint. You should not feel ashamed. Um, what can we even say? About what's happening right now. There's a lot. There's a lot going on. Uh, uh, th- there's a lot of projects that are in in the works. Uh, some I can talk about. Some I can't. Well, no, I can't talk about all of them. Number one, we've we've got uh, uh, President's Day coming up, so we're gonna have hopefully some really fun stuff with the contender coming up. But that means uh, writing, working with some really cool people that I was very excited to go back and. Uh, uh, go go back and forth with. Uh, might be doing a live stream, not here, but somewhere else, working with another media partner. We're doing a new mini uh, mini expansion for the, for the contender coming up. A lot of writing, a lot of deadlines, 
but none bigger than what I mentioned at the top of the show. That is my politics, politics, politics program, uh, uh, which is the other side of this Patreon. We do two shows, two main free shows uh, for the price of one on the Patreon, patreon.com slash J-U-R-Y. But for Politics, 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 we're doing a live show coming up March 1st in San Francisco at Piano Fight. However, there is some more stress to that. Because uh, initially, here's how, here's how booking a show by yourself works, okay? Normally, what happens is you go to a venue, you book the venue, you sell the tickets, and then you reconcile with the venue on what you owe them, what they owe you, yada, yada, yada. So that's what happens. I'm going to pull back. I'm going to go see a little bit. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to tell you all how, how things work here. I went on over to Piano Fight, a venue I love that I really, really think is awesome. It's one of the coolest venues in San Francisco, specifically for sketch comedy and the kind of stuff that I think uh, politics, politics, politics will, an audience that will be very, uh, uh, very cool for that. And I got their smaller room. They've got two rooms. One that seats about 47, one that seats about 97. And as Diamond Club always does, you have reacted to this news tremendously. Because I have not done a tremendous amount of plugging for this show up till now. Now, from now until March 1st, February 13th until March 1st, you will hear me plug the ever-loving shit out of this. But just to give you a sense, in a 47-seat theater, we've sold about 30. We are mostly full on that venue as of right now. So I go there yesterday to Piano Fight to go scout out some of the possible places where we could put cameras, right? And I'm talking to my contact at Piano Fight. And the dude's like, well, have you seen your ticket sales? And I say, seen it? It's literally all I look at. I just look at a, uh, a, a number... And uh, I know it says tickets uh, uh, on it, but I have this vision problem that I've had this since I was a kid, where instead of saying uh, uh, tickets, like I might be dyslexic. It's really, really weird. Instead of seeing tickets, I I, I read uh, 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 self-worth. Like that's something that I read instead of tickets. And that number goes uh, up, right? And like sometimes it goes down. Like people ask for refunds. And I'm like, oh, I'm worth less than I was right before. And then sometimes it goes up and you're like, oh, that's great. I'm worth more to myself than I was before. Look at that. What an amazing resource I now have for myself where I can gauge exactly how much uh, 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 I am valued within my own brain thanks to this handy web portal. And he's like, that's great sales for right out of the gate. Have you considered, because this normally would not be an option, but our big room is still open. So based on how I normally, because that guy watches the ticket sales for everything, It's like, based on how I normally do this, uh, uh, you're going to sell out in this theater probably, you know, uh, within the next couple weeks. (laughs) 
<laughs> live in the Twitch chat. Anonymous gay dinosaur has given us, given, given the stream a hundred bits, which is a dollar. Thank you so much, anonymous gay dinosaur. I very rarely shout out donations <laughs> on the stream, but I feel like the podcast listeners would appreciate as I open up my soul uh, uh, that anonymous gay dinosaur <laughs> has given me a dollar. So he's like, I don't got to know now, but if you would like to upgrade to the other room, it'll be a little bit more, you know, to rent it, but you could sell more tickets. Because again, I go from where I am now, which is probably just a couple friends telling a couple friends to buy tickets and having a sellout. To having a couple friends talk to a couple friends and only have the theater half full. Not to mention immediately making that 30 ticket sold self worth number immediately go from, oh, I feel very good about myself to now I am only a third full on this theater. Now, I haven't done it yet. And initially, all I did was feel fear. But then, of course, I have the lack of foresight or consequence voice in my head. Now, oftentimes, what I think resonates with people the most is the fact that I am a very self-loathing person. I've tried to be very, very upfront throughout my entire professional career with that. And I think that that is something that binds us all together. Find me somebody who doesn't hate themselves, and I will show you a piece of wood. Because, <laughs> listen, you could be like, no, but my buddy Jim doesn't hate himself. Friend, your buddy Jim is an Ottoman. Oh, shit. I never realized that. I just thought he was a very nice man who allowed me to put my feet on his neck. But what will probably come as a surprise to very few of you is that I also have a very, you know, leap-before-I-look sense to me. And we're going to get into that in a second. And so now I am torn between two worlds. Where either A, within a week, I've kind of given myself a, a, an internal number where if I don't sell these amount of tickets in a week, then I'm not going to do it. I'll just be fucking, you know, fine. You want to know what? I'll just oversell that venue That'll be fine. I can, uh, uh, I'll know. I could, I could probably book a bigger room for next time, but that's that. But if I do sell those extra, if I do sell to that level, man, then it'll be time to, to go even further, which will be exciting. But it's a lot of stress. There's a lot of pull and, and, and push, a lot of tug uh, uh, of war here. I will tell you where my boisterous past was fully on display. Or rather, my boisterous sense to leap before I look. Um, how do we put this? I was home for a bachelor party a couple weeks ago. In South Florida, I was staying at my mom's house. While I was looking through my DVD collection, I found these. For those of you who are listening on audio, allow me to describe it. It is a jewel case. Very, 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 very late 90s, early aughts. A jewel case with a printed out picture of yours truly, shirtless. A very younger version of me, an early 20s version of Justin Robert Young. I am wearing glasses for some reason. I have a mustache and a beard and hair down to my shoulders. I am shushing anybody who looks upon this CD. And I am to the right of the title, Sometimes the Bear Gets You. 
by Justin Young, which is also very odd that I didn't go with Justin Robert Young on that because I was using that as a writing uh, a writing name. On the inside, we have Sometimes the Bear Gets You, written and performed by Justin Young. Track one is the whole fucking set, 16 minutes and 46 seconds. Recorded in the Jabberwocky Cafe at Syracuse University on March 24, 2005, in a show that included Dan Leaf, Dave Young, and Jake Goldman. Leaf emceed the event and can be heard at the end of the disc, making a reference to a Dave Young joke earlier in the evening. Not pictured. On the inside, there is uh, something that I did not even try to pretend wasn't a Philips CDR. Schlug in the chat uh, uh, asks, are we auctioning the album on air tonight? We are not, and here's why. I made a decision, probably Thursday, if not Wednesday afternoon, that I was going to give away a copy of this. I decided that the best way to give away a copy of it were, was to uh, goose some sales on the sticker store, stickers or DIAF.com, where we have fine Diamond Club stickers, Diamond Club pins, Diamond Club patches. Now, this all seems fairly harmless and very much on brand, and that's what I tried to, to put together in an uh, e email, uh, email blast where I basically described that this was an embarrassment, a professional embarrassment, but I'd be happy to share this moment of growth with somebody that supports me now through the merchandise on stickers or DIAF.com. So that's what I did. Sent out an email, sent out a, a couple tweets, a couple Snapchats, And then my stream on Fridays, as I mentioned earlier, is the Friday hype train. This normally uh, has, has evolved to become a call-in talk show. We have a number. People can call in. It's a fun time. But I decided, because oftentimes the Friday hype train is where uh, uh, some of the most rambunctious and, and hardcore elements of my streaming community come to gather that I would share this with them. I would do something I had not done in many, many years. And that is something that I did not do before I decided to promote a giveaway of this CD on my Snapchat. It's not something that I thought of before I wrote the email that went out on MailChimp. It was certainly not something I thought about before I tweeted a picture of the CD on my Twitter. Yes, friends, many of you already can see this coming a mile of way. On that Friday hype train, I listened to it. I did all that without knowing what was on the CD. I assumed that I was going to be embarrassed by the fact that I was a bad stand-up comedian. This is fairly clear. But I didn't exactly know how bad. And that's that. So I listened to it live on the air. And by and large, it was what one might expect from somebody who was very early in his stand-up career. <laughs> Although, I guess, I was also at the end of my stand-up career. Because I didn't really do it much after that. But very early in his comedy career, trying to emulate his heroes. At the time, I was listening to a lot of Dave Attell, Dave Chappelle, David Cross, a lot of Daves. 
now that I think about it. They were fearless. They tackled social issues. They're also among the best people to ever do it, ever. And so, if they are nuclear scientists, I am a hobbyist trying to reverse engineer their wizardry in my garage and doing it with reckless abandon, not realizing exactly how dangerous things are. I uh, am not good at it, nor am I good at selecting what I think I should joke about. The biggest disconnect between then and now is I don't have a sense of what the audience is looking to hear or how to talk to them. But what was the most embarrassing were the topics supplanted only by the most embarrassing, which is the language. In general, I don't say anything completely reprehensible specific until one moment wherein I am voicing a real person, a, a fictionalized version of a real person I knew who was a loud oversharer. He's an Italian manager of a restaurant that I worked at, and he was a loud oversharer. He. <laughs> What's the best way to put this? I said the F slur. And I, I said, I was listening to myself say it live on the internet. It was and is mortifying. It's horrific. It's something that I'm Intensely not proud of. Now I can go back and point to how long ago it was and how different uh, how different things were, but ultimately it's me and my voice. And so then I had the question of how I handle it. So I went back into the I went back into the uh, 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 the audio for the podcast that I put out to patrons, and uh, I decided to leave it with a little bit of a uh, uh, a little bit of a, a, a pre warning. And then also bleeping out the word specifically. But then that left me with this. How on earth do I handle giving this away as a fucking promo for people who bought stickers? How do I feel good or at least like not like a total bag of shit for trying to spur sales to my merch store by peddling old hate speech. At least that's the worst part of my brain that's yelling at me for that. So I literally just packed it up a couple minutes ago, and I, I, I selected who the quote-unquote winner was going to do, or the uh, winner was going to be. And I wrote them a letter. And I can read it for you right now. Because, you know, musical chemist says you don't do it. Well, you know, the problem is, you know, I could just refund everybody's money. That'd be one way to do it. But then again, you don't know. I mean, like, people wouldn't buy it. Wouldn't buy the stickers if they didn't want it. They wouldn't buy the pins if they didn't want it. 
I could send everything for free, I guess. But I just decided to carry out the bargain. And here's what I wrote. Hello, person who won. I used their first name. Congratulations. You now own my shame. In all seriousness, this is a kind of weird moment. I made the offer to send my college comedy to folks who purchased stickers before I listened to it. Then, I listened to it. It's bad, as I feared. But there are also moments that genuinely made me cringe. The jokes are crude and insensitive. Uh, they are. Uh, let me let me t- pause and add editorially. Uh, I always wanted to punch me. Oh, my God. All right, back to the letter. You can certainly see some of the lack of better judgment that is still with me on display. I used a slur toward the end that made me want to evaporate into dust. I can hide behind the fact that it was 13 years ago, but it's still something ugly that I am not proud of. And now it is yours to do what you want with. Thank you so much for supporting me in my career. In a way, the album can show you how far I've come and how much your support made that possible. Justin Robert Young. I don't know if I handled it the right way, but I felt good about how I handled it. I'm still processing things, to be totally honest with you. Part of me wants to defend where I was coming from, and part of me just wants to lay with my belly up and and surrender all money and uh, uh, I just want to uh, become an accountant, right? But I guess that's part of the penance, right? And that's part of our evolving and changing culture is that in maturity comes empathy, hopefully. Hopefully. And with empathy comes the literal understanding of pain. And if the feeling that I am feeling right now is not guilt, i.e. something that I would hope to avoid, but rather a small sliver of the pain that is delivered to the folks that would be offended, rightly so, by the kind of ham-fisted comedy that I was making, then that's the point. Because I wasn't feeling it then. And I am feeling it now. It also has given me one very, 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 very clear lesson. Listen to your shit before you try to give it away for promo, you dumb motherfucker! Oh my God. Jesus Christ, how fucking stupid. Oh, good Lord. Oh, my God. What a stupid fucking idiot I am. Like, literally listen to it. Like, uh, listen to it at least to just say, like, oh, okay, well, maybe I should re-edit it. You know, no one needs to know that the worst shit's on there. I can just keep that little slice of shame to myself. I can take out that part and have it be the end. But no, 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 no. You got to be real. Uh, yeah, dog. You got to be real. You got to be you got to be honest with the audience, man. That's the only way to live, man. No, it's not. Next time I find something embarrassing that I want to share with you guys, you better fucking believe that I'm going to watch it or I'm going to listen to it, and then I'm going to edit out literally anything that I'm not comfortable getting out. Congratulations, Dennis. Let's move on. Today is February the 13th. It is my wife's birthday, Ashley Paramore. I am very, very thrilled for that. Um, I always like birthdays. I think birthdays are always a fun time, Uh, uh, not only because we are one year older, but normally because, like New Year's Eve, we take it as one of those little moments where we can... Uh, where we can kind of self-reflect 
and plan outward for the future. Uh, my wife had an amazing year, and I know she's going to have another one coming up. So a big shout out to my wife, Ashley Paramore. I also love it because my wife's birthday is February 13th, which means it's right next to February 14th, which means I can duct tape her birthday and Valentine's Day right together. I have always loved Valentine's Day, and here's why. Very selfishly, I love Valentine's Day because it, uh, in my younger days, when I was not an old married man and we weren't worried more about getting enough storage bins to get things off the floor, but were rather uh, in, 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 in playful young relationships. I love Valentine's Day because my birthday is March 5th. Which means I never looked at it as this time where I had to spend a bunch of money on my significant other. I viewed it as a down payment for, well, if I do this for you on Valentine's Day, you know what's coming up in two weeks. But let me give you all young whippersnappers a little, uh, let me, let me, let me, let me, let me hip you to some life game. Valentine's Day in a long-term... Actually, no, no, not in long-term. In, in any relationship, okay, is effectively a concert writer. How many of you guys are familiar with the concept of a concert writer? Concert writer is basically the list of demands that a band or an act makes when they are coming to a venue. Famously, rock stars have had ridiculous contract writers. You know, specifically uh, uh, brown M and M's, a, a snifter filled with only brown M and M's. Right, uh, very specific orders of certain kinds of liquor. Apparently, John Tesh demanded that there be a WWF action figure waiting for him in his dressing room at any venue he played at. While these often become laughable examples of the height of celebrity mania, in reality, as the buck points out in our chat room, the reason why bands actually do this is to make sure that the venues are reading their contracts. Because if a venue has the dumb shit you put in the writer right, you can almost certainly make sure that they've done things like, you know, assemble the technical stuff the way they need to. Or that they're not going to try to fuck you on the money at the end of the night. So... I think a lot of guys get Valentine's Day mixed up. All they do is think about all the shit they gotta do and how much they're competing with everybody else. You gotta get flowers. You gotta get candies. You gotta get reservations. You gotta do all this shit. But they don't look at it as the opportunity to be the venue that gets things right. Because, let me let you guys know, you don't need to get flowers. In fact, many women would rather flowers any day other than Valentine's Day. You don't necessarily need the reservation. All you need to do is show that you remember literally anything about his or her life. That's it. Literally, the writer that you are getting in the mail on New Year's Eve is you have two months 
to literally prove that you're playing, paying any kind of attention to your significant other. That's it. That's all you got to do. It's over, Johnny. Do they like a certain television show? Make sure you get them a little something from there. Hell, you don't even have to get anything super awesome. You can get uh, a frame from the Salvation Army, print out a picture of somebody from, you know, from that television show that you guys watch together, and, and frame it and give it to them. Can't do a reservation at her favorite restaurant? How about you try to do your best to cook? How about you try to do your best to get takeout from that restaurant? There is literally nothing you have to do except prove that you are actively a part of things. Now, this is not universal, of course. Some people are a little fussier than others. But I'm just letting you know that Valentine's Day is the snifter of brown M&Ms for a relationship. And to succeed, you need not spend. No, no, no. You literally just need to be an active participant. And eat the booty, says Bane Thor 90 so there we go. <laughs> Two things. Make sure that you are an active participant in your relationship on Valentine's Day and eat the booty. Of course, I just want to bring up this, that uh, uh, we are now a year into what I believe might be the greatest idea that we have ever come up with on this show, and that is Singles Day. Uh, not everybody is in a relationship on Valentine's Day, and it oftentimes can be a very, very, very lonely evening. Our culture is wrapped up in the idea that you should be in love on Valentine's Day, and so if you were not, then I can certainly empathize with the idea that things feel a little lonely. So, I came up with this, and Golden Corral has still not gotten back to me. So I will repeat it for you guys right now. What I would like to do, I'm begging you to help me with this, Golden Corral, is that on Valentine's Day, you turn the Golden Corral into a singles-only event. Now, what do you think? Justin, you're just going to get a bunch of singles to go to the Golden Corral and eat their faces off? Yes, but much more. Because not only would I like for all the singles who are otherwise feeling downtrodden by a cultural oppression of a couple's only Valentine's Day to bring their sweatpants down to the Golden Corral and fill their plates over and over and over again with the prime rib, with the shrimp cocktail, with the chocolate fountain. But there's more. In that moment where everybody is understanding that, you know, we can survive this too. I want there to be a union in suffering. Yes. I want this to be a speed dating event as well. Now, I'm pretty sure that there's no drinking at the Golden Corral. That's fine. We're going to roll in a couple mini bars because this shit's going to get loose. Because it's not just like any other speed dating thing. No, no, no. I want this to also be a lock-in. Yeah, I know. You haven't heard of a lock-in since church lock-ins when you were in your in middle school. Well, guess what? We're bringing it back. We're bringing it back at the Golden Corral singles-only speed dating. You show up in sweatpants. You're not, you don't have any makeup on, ladies. You don't have any uh, button-down shirts, guys. You are rolling in looking slobby as hell. Everybody's going and they're eating at least 20 chicken wings, some meatloaf, and a, a goddamn gallon of gravy apiece. 
Everybody's burping, everybody's farting, and then we sit down and we do some speed dating. We are releasing any and all pretensions, and we are only getting down to this, a primal connection on a day when literally everything is telling you you're wrong. You are staring across from somebody who says you're right. And if you don't feel that spark, bing, you move it on. Bing, you move it on. Bing, you move it on. Now, maybe all you want is somebody to commiserate with, and maybe the ladies meet with other ladies, and they say, uh, uh, you want to know what? Let's just move over to the uh, uh, this section of the restaurant and horse off, maybe get an early night's sleep, and then get the hell out of here at this singles-only speed dating Golden Corral lockout. And maybe the dude bros are sitting there with other dude bros talking about dude bros thing, but I'm just going to let you know. I'm just going to let you know that some of these people might fuck. Yes, some of these people might fuck, and it's encouraged. It's encouraged at this drunken, all-you-can-eat, speed-dating, singles-only, Golden Corral lock-in. Some of these people are going to do things that they would regret. Yes, it is all-you-can-eat, Salad bar. Yes, it is all you can eat chicken fingers. And yes, it is all you can eat booty. That might happen too. We're not going to close off the possibilities. You have a world ahead of you, single people. There is a million different pathways that you can walk down. While Valentine's Day might be a celebration for couples about a future that they can plan together, about a love that they can share, what you have, singles on Valentine's Day, are something far more important and far more precious. Possibility. A possibility that is chicken fried and waiting for you at the Golden Corral, all you can drink, all you can eat, singles only, speed dating event, lock in where people might fuck. For whatever reason, Golden Corral has not gotten back to me on this. But we wait in vain. We will do this every year. On Valentine's Day, until Golden Corral does what I think is a no-brainer. I mean, come on! Key Sasha says, like, you couldn't go with your partner and pretend you're not together. Kinky. All right, there is uh, uh you want to know what? Maybe I'll save this for another day. I have I have one more relationship thing that I wanted to talk about and that was a uh, breakup amnesty day. All right, uh, uh, uh podcast listeners, do you remember me doing a bit on breakup amnesty day? Cuz this is something that I came up with a long time ago with a girlfriend of mine that I broke up with within the next 6 months. But Break up amnesty day. We'll have to wait for another week. If you remember me saying this, then 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 go ahead and let me know. Let's go ahead and get into the emails. Justin Robert Young at gmail.com. Again, Justin Robert Young at gmail.com. Scale writes, I have a dating trend for you. It's not really uh, trending now. It was apparently a thing a few decades ago. I learned it in basic training in the mid aughts from a corporal who shall remain nameless. He called it bush dicking. It's where you've been out in the field for a month or so, crawling through the mud and digging trenches. When you get back to the barracks, wrap your penis in plastic wrap and take a shower. You get super clean, put on some expensive cologne, dress in your fanciest threads, and attempt to pick up the hottest woman you can and bed them. But your penis has been wrapped in plastic since the washing process, and it still reeks of four weeks of trekking through the Australian bush, hence the name bush dicking. It was never really practiced by anybody in my platoon, but this corporal assured me it was all the rage back when he was in basic training in the early 90s. One question, a few other NCOs, whilst never witnessing it firsthand, had at least heard of it. Nerds, it seems, aren't only the only ones needing in uh, personal hygiene. Love the show. Keep it up. Oh, Australians. What a fun, frisky people you are. Oh, my God. Bush dicking. Really? 
Like, you would want to do all the hard work of getting dressed to, to prank the woman that you uh, would hope to sleep with? Is the hope to do all the work where you could possibly get your dick wet only for you to unwrap it like it's some kind of, a, 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 you know, a, 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 a treat shipped from China? Something something uh, uh, shipped uh, from from uh, lands far and wide, and what what lies in wait for this lucky lady who was charmed by the military man? Oh, a stank dick, huh? Cool. Like, what do you do then? Say surprise? <laughs> you say that's not a knife. Like, what on earth would you possibly do once you reveal a, a, a stank, smelly, dirt-encrusted ding? Or maybe it's just some shit your corporate told you. Uh, speaking of dicks and smells, Swinger Listener writes in, Swinger Listener here from the Nertacular Orgy. As you may imagine, I have spent some time uh, up and up close and personal with people. So let me tell you that nerds do smell worse than uh, normies, and I know why. During uh, one of my wife and I's outings here, there was an African-American man with a comically large wang who smelled great. He even stepped away during the fun to towel off his sweat and deodorize. After getting over how big his dick was, seriously, I almost asked to touch it to see if it was real. I'm above average and felt like Tiny Tim next to him. Anyway, afterwards, I got to talking to him about his great hygiene. He said it was from playing sports. He said that the coaches stressed the importance of hygiene when not playing. No one from my D&D group ever stressed hygiene when I was young. Bottom line, sports people are taught hygiene by their mentors and nerds do not. Uh, swinger listener. Always a great addition to the mailbag. Uh, uh, aside from that fun little dalliance into how big that dude's dick was, I think that there is something here. For those of you who are just joining us, uh, we have been talking about uh, why nerds have a smell problem. And we are trying to fix this from within the community. This is why we are bringing this up. We're not shaming nerds who smell... We are trying to diagnose the problem so we might help it. And I think what he is saying is that this is a nurture argument and not a nature argument. It's not that nerds necessarily smell. It's that there are different elements in place for various different segments of our population that stress personal hygiene in a way that nerds are not taught. So I would say this. At your D&D group, please make sure that everybody smells appropriate. Do not shy away from letting anybody you know. If you are a teacher of an AV club, please let everybody know that you are not allowed to touch the equipment unless you don't smell like a bag of ass. Mark writes, uh, I've written a list of dating trends for you. Ride-versing, offering to drive, a, uh, to drive on a date, but really hoping the other person will say, oh, no, I'll drive. Compromiserating, or com compromising, telling the other person that you'd like to, uh, what, what you'd like to do, but caving immediately when they suggest something better. Lazy tipping, looking at the bill, doubling the price, and moving the decimal place. Uh, once to lazily determine the tip. That's not lazily. That's like actually a good way to do it. Fourth major, defaulting to the fourth date option as a matter of course. Oh, that's interesting. So that's like you're trying to figure out what to do on a date and you just write out the four options and you just do the fourth. Uh, Towalking. T-A-W-A-L-K-I-N-G. Working a nighttime stroll into your plans in order to get outside and enjoy a little private conversation. Hang and dang, ending a date at a coffee shop uh, in order to hang out and swear. I have no idea what that is. 
and laugh belling, laughing loudly and boisterous when your date says something funny. These are all like trends or just descriptions of dating behavior, but I really like all of them. In fact, got me thinking. What if we made our own book of dating trends? What if you guys continue to submit dating trends, like robocopping and everything, and we put it into an ebook and we sold it on Amazon? I think that could be really fun. That could be a fun project that we could do together. What do you say? Everybody go uh, go ahead, justinrobertyoung at gmail.com. If you have an idea for a dating trend, we've certainly talked enough about them. If you've got names, I can write them. Just give me names, in fact. In fact, that's all I'm asking for. I'm just asking for names that don't mean shit of dating trends, and I'll write the rest. I just need the names. If you want to write them, go ahead. But all I really need is names. JustinRobertYoung at gmail.com. Put jury in the subject line. Our final email is from Jason. Jason says, I heard the email on the episode Robocopping about the guy in the open marriage with a lesbian wife. I actually went through a situation that almost led me down this path. My wife came out that she was a lesbian and the idea was floated temporarily that we stay together under a similar understanding as the emailer with an open marriage. I'd be lying if I didn't say I was intrigued by the idea at the time. But I also have two kids with her, so the idea of keeping uh, together in a happy marriage, though without nearly as much physical contact, was something I thought was worth trying. It ended up that the idea was retracted by her before I could answer. I hadn't really thought about it in quite some time until the listener's email came up. If her and I had a better relationship at that point, marriage was great, but it fell apart for obvious reasons. I think uh, it could have worked out, but I'll, I'd al I'll always be left wondering if I, I was keeping myself from finding somebody else. But then again, the open marriage could still let you find somebody else, although clearly more complicated. Look, I'm not going to shit on anybody trying to make something work. I think that for every ass a seat, but as a general rule, baby. You got to get out and fly. You can't be out here trying to figure out. You can't be trying to to walk the uh, walk the the the, the trip wires every day. Occam's razor your relationship whenever you can. That's a good. That's a good general rule. Again, folks, that is Justin Robert Young at Gmail dot com. Put Jerry in the subject line. All right. I guess that's pretty much it. Happy Valentine's Day to everybody. I, I do love whenever we get emails from couples. And, uh, uh, you know, I know oftentimes the emails and advice that we kind of talk about on this show is more in the vein of uh, those who aren't in the best situation. But a big shout out to everybody for whom life is good. I mentioned earlier that, you know, I think self-loathing is a uh, part of my brand. And I know it is, but I don't mean that to say that I am constantly at war with myself. In fact, I think life is pretty good. And just understanding that those feelings are okay, which is something that I've come to learn through maturity. Although not enough maturity to have me not release a horrifying comedy album on the internet live before I listen to it. Oh, well. What do you say we both just leave? Again, bit.ly slash SF Sex Show. March 1st, 7 p.m. That is a Thursday. The live politics, 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 sex scandal bracket show. If you are interested in going, please do me a favor and buy your ticket now so I know whether or not I got to move to the main room. You can email me, justinrobertyoung at gmail.com. Put jury in the subject line. You can follow me, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat at Justin R. Young. 
And you can join the conversation at diamondclub.reddit.com. Join our Discord. Bit.ly slash jury discord. But as always, folks, this is your old pal, Justin Robert Young, reminding you that no matter what happens, Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs> <laughs>